our first presenter who I've been uh, lucky enough to have in my English senior seminar class. Our first presenter is Liam Quinn. I would like to start by addressing the birthplace of this project. My title, as Dr. Barrett said, is The Pliability of Plays, The Uncanny Experience of the Shakespearean Spectator. For years, I have been coming to the symposium in the winter and spring, and I was worried about what I would actually write my presentation on because everyone that stood up here seemed so smart and passionate about everything they were doing, and so I was just very, very nervous about finding something I was just as passionate about. But luckily, that worry kind of subsided when Last semester we read Freud's essay on the uncanny in Dr. Sheridan's literary theory class, and I found myself disagreeing with a rather weighty statement that Freud makes. And you can switch the slides to the next one, and the one after that. Cool. <laughs> Which is up on there, up on the, uh, on the board. And I won't read the full thing, but please stay with this. I can read it if you would like. Essentially, Freud says that because of the contextual fictional reality, in which Shakespeare's ghosts live in the way that we as readers or viewers adapt our judgment to that reality, the ghosts are incapable of being uncanny in Shakespeare's plays. Now, multiple assertions in this statement made me question the accuracy of it by Freud's own theory and standards. Why do ghosts lose their uncanniness because we adapt our judgment to Shakespeare's fictional realm? Isn't all fictional literature fictional? Do we not always adapt our minds to enter the world of fiction that we so enjoy? Why do some fictional things get to be uncanny, but Freud's ghosts do not? In order to understand the rationale of understand the rationale of Freud's opinions on Shakespeare's ghosts, it's necessary to have a sense of what Freud meant by uncanniness in the first place. Freud's essay begins with an examination of the familiar versus the unfamiliar. These two concepts seem like complete opposites, but really when Ford explains it, he explains that the moment that moments become uncanny when the familiar, things that are familiar, are presented to us in a way that seems unfamiliar. The rest of his essay is spent divulging how this occurs, which ultimately boils down to one main explanation, the return of the universe. And Ford believed that in order to live a normal life, that our minds are constantly engaged in repressing the urges, traumas, desires and so forth that personally that are personally or socially disruptive to us. For Freud, the experience of the uncanny is triggered when we encounter something that causes a return of what has been repressed. That is something familiar, all too familiar, that we have tried to alienate or hide from ourselves. For example, the doppelganger. The doppelganger is a repressed version of ourselves, usually with some sense of unnerving evil that we are forced to come face to face with. The return of a repressed doppelganger gives us an eerie, uncomfortable feeling, just like when we see, for example, a ghost. Ghosts, similarly, are not just a supernatural phenomenon, but to an extent are a manifestation of our own repressed anxieties. Although we widely believe in society that the supernatural is not real, when we encounter something that causes us to question that understanding, we feel deeply uncomfortable. So now we know a little bit about Freud's theory it is clear that ghosts are a perfect example of the return of the birth. I, I inquire then, is there a way that we might reclaim some uncanniness in Shakespeare's text that is consistent with Freud's ideas, but still allows us to reflect on a historical, historically accurate uh, understanding of the plays? Prior to doing research, I thought my project would set out to prove that Freud, or Shakespeare's plays are uncanny. I quickly realized with Shakespeare place being 400 years old, that plenty of people have talked about that, and that people have proven it and used Freud's for for theories in that way, so I really was pushed to push my own thinking further. And in doing so, I realized I was, while other scholars were interested in the dynamics between the, of the uncanniness of the ghosts, between characters in the play, I was more interested in the dynamics between the ghosts and the spectators, really, and how that uncanniness comes to life for the spectators. So as a result, I have a much more meta-theatrical focus regarding how Shakespeare's ghosts work on the imagination of the spectators. 
Now, I am no philosopher, but modern theories of imagination suggest that its main focus is to, the main power is to process mental images and experiences and to make non-rational associations between those images and experiences. In other words, imagination tends to be associated with a nebulous realm of pure thought rather than empirical reality. However, if we examine theories of imagination from the Renaissance period when Shakespeare was writing, we do not find the same clear-cut dichotomy. According to these theories, the mind has the power to manifest real physical symptoms over the body. The more we think about something imaginatively, the more it has the ability to affect us in very real ways. In an early 17th century treatise on literary theory, Thomas Haywood says that witnessing plays about the likes of Achilles and Hercules made Alexander the Great into the man he was, impressing upon him their acts of greatness and causing him to follow suit. Slightly more ridiculously, Robert Burton, writing in 1621, recounts the pregnant woman whose imagination was provoked by seeing a bear give birth to a very hairy child. And uh, yeah, Michelle de Montagne, writing in 1580, tells of an instance where a 22-year-old woman became a heavily bearded man simply by imaginatively identifying with male behavior. These are example, examples of the power of the mind and body and the narrow line between the real and unreal according to theories of Renaissance imagination. Thus, through the lens of this of Renaissance imagination, we perceive the essential contradiction in Freud's essay. Remember that statement from earlier where Freud says that Shakespeare's ghosts cannot be uncanny when those on the board? Well, earlier in his essay, earlier in his essay, he says that an uncanny effect often arises when the boundary between fantasy and reality is blurred. Shakespeare likely intended his audience to experience this blurring of boundaries, considering how much he makes the stage come to life. Therefore, when Freud contradicts himself, he highlights Shakespeare's probable intention for the spectator to experience things like the uncanny through an adaptation of the mind. If we are to experience fictional, liter fictional literature, as Freud says we are, by adapting our mind to that fictional world, then we are not eliminating the uncanny, but rather heightening our ability to experience it. Having established my argument against Freud, I can now turn to relationships within Julius Caesar and Hamlet, where Shakespeare highlights uncanniness as something that may not only affect his characters, but his spectators and audience as well. In Julius Caesar, for instance, Shakespeare never makes Brutus' motivations transparent. While it may seem like Brutus by killing Caesar, is one point in Roman tradition on one hand, on the other, he's a harsh traitor. He himself never relates the motivations, leading to us to look to other characters in the play for explanation. Much like the play's spectators, Brutus listens to other characters' reasons. As he plots to murder Caesar, placing the spectator in the same position as him as we all try to decipher his ultimate motivations. The infinite defer deferral of Brutus's reasons, to use an expression of Roland Bart, is, represent is representative of the spectator's constant chase to find the meaning behind Brutus's and Brutus's actions when the metaphorical stage out of the us, the spectators. In Act 1, Brutus denies the ability to see his facial expressions when Cassie is asking what is bothering him, and the audience is right there with him in this moment. Cassie says, tell me, good Brutus, can you see your face? Brutus says, no, Cassie, but the eye sees not itself, but by reflection, by some other things. In denying the ability to see himself, Brutus sets up on Candace to be experienced when the ghost appears on stage. Therefore, when the ghost does appear, and the audience has already been brought into the play in an increased capacity as spectator adjacent to Brutus, the uncanniness is palpable for everyone. The ghost identifies itself as Brutus's evil self, forcing Brutus to come face to face with the repressed version of himself that he denied in his own. The uncanniness of recognizing Brutus's uncanny double is not only uncanny for Brutus, but for the spectator as well. As spectators, we have identified imaginatively with Brutus. So when the ghost appears on stage, and we are also forced, we are also forced to reconcile with our own repressed anxieties of our involvement in the killing of Caesar as well. As uh, excuse me, holding <laughs> true to the beliefs of the Renaissance imagination, the imaginative reality of the theater can produce real effects within the spectator especially when there is such a parallel relationship between character and spectator. 
the uncanniness in Hamlet follows a similar relationship with blurred boundaries. Hamlet is a sort of spectator as well, like Bruce. Throughout the play, though, he is quite paralyzed, never able to act on the urges and desires that really drive him back. The ghost in the play, of course, also can only speak, not act. Hamlet himself quickly becomes a ghost-like figure when he, early in the play, and Ophelia notes that he is pale as his shirt and with a look as, been, as he, if he has been loosened out of hell. Similarly, when the theater troupe arrives at Elsinore, Hamlet possesses the ability only to speak, only to instruct them not to do the actual acting. Through his devolution of ghostliness, ghostliness, Hamlet is the perennial spectator. In the rogue and peasant slaves of the Greek, Hamlet becomes frustrated with the fake emotion that an actor can express, that actor can express, without the real anger of someone like him. In moments like this where Hamlet acts as a spectator and criticizes himself, the spectator in the audience becomes the spectator on the stage with Hamlet in that moment. Prior to the performance of the Mousetrap play, which I'll speak about in a second, Hamlet tells the actors to hold as toward the mirror up to nature. The way I see it, Hamlet is not just telling the players to perform in such a way so that the, the boundaries between reality and drama are blurred, but he's also telling the audience that the boundary between them and the play is constantly unclear. When Hamlet invites the audience into his position of spectator, the lines between character, spectator, play, and reality, fiction, and truth become blurred, and the spectator walks alongside Hamlet on his journey of dimensions. The ultimate moment of metatheatricality for, for Hamlet is the mousetrap play in the scene two. As he sets the stage, actually, as he sets the stage for the death of his father, Hamlet's hope is that he will catch Claudius' reaction and cement the truth. Yet here is another moment where Hamlet is the ultimate spectator. Hamlet's actions during the mousetrap mouse trap play are, of course, up to interpretation when the play is performed, but his spectatorship is unquestioned. Just before the play begins. Hamlet makes clear his intent to watch the reactions of Claudius and Gertrude as he banters with Ophelia, saying, For look you, how cheerfully my mother looks, and my father died within these two hours. Before the play starts, Hamlet watches the faces of those he will watch during the play, setting himself in his role as spectator. The audience is also given the opportunity to watch the murder of King Hamlet play out on stage for the first time during the Oscar. Experiencing the uncanniness of that scene. For Claudius, the play forces him to re experience the killing of King Hamlet, really eliciting the ultimate definition of the return to the press. For Hamlet, the play is the haunting reenactment of a moment he never knew to be true. And yet, in watching the play and the reactions of the people and the spectators, he finds out that Claudius did indeed murder his father, a truth that presents itself with the repetition. By looking between Hamlet, players, Claudius, we as spectators are not just spectating the play that is happening before us on stage, but spectating Hamlet, spectating the other characters, highlighting the fragility of the play and the uncanniness of the moment where we as audience members feel the unnerving tension that Hamlet is forced to reconcile with throughout the play. So, the ultimate question, was Shakespeare conscious of the uncanny effects that his plays would have on his audience? I think yes. It is with clear intention that these tragedies focus on spectator-like characters that blur the lines between character and audience. My analysis of these moments points to ways in which the audience participate in the plays, consciously breaking the fourth wall and examining how the experiences of other characters can become the experience of the audience as well. Ultimately, I find it unfair for Freud to speak for everyone when he says that Shakespeare's ghosts and plays cannot be their king, and while they may not be for everyone, they're certainly the possibility. Um, 
clearly Freud had read Shakespeare yeah. Yeah. and probably in English as well as in German. Fair. But I wonder if part of his problem was did he ever see a really great performance? I know he acted in one. He acted in one. He did. 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 Um, early on in my early drafts, I made a statement where you know, he was that, that he was saying in the place can't be uncanny when viewed, and then Dr. Sheridan really pointed out to me, it's like we don't know what he's saying. <laughs> that, that, you know, it could be both the, the reader or, you know, or the viewer, and um, I really think that he's, he's making a stark statement about it. It's, I mean, it's pretty clear he's a prolific writer and a lot of things. So I think uh, as far as what we have from this essay, he is definitely. Making that statement that because of the whole adaptation of the mind, the fictional reality in which the ghosts live, that he doesn't think they can be okay. Yeah. Uh, your presentation is kind of building off of the previous discussion. Uh, does it does your opinion change if the mode in which you're receiving, you're taking in Shakespeare changes. If yeah, you're, that's yeah, if you're watching the play, if you're reading it, or if you're watching a movie with yeah. an audience, without an audience. Good question. I don't think so. I think I am working that there's always the possibility for it. And I'm not saying that, that always it always happens, you know. So I think for the for the uncanny and return of the press, a lot of times it is a very individual feeling. You know, there are things that we can experience that for us specifically can elicit this deeply uncomfortable feeling, right? So I'm not saying, because you know, in play, it is gonna be a human actor, live actor playing on stage, I'm not necessarily saying that immediately you're gonna be like, ah, and like, feel that. But I think there is that possibility for if we identify and match with something with these characters, and there are, you know, that you know, there really is the chance for this to, to occur within everyone. And the same thing when you're reading, you know, when you're reading a play, you can become very immersed in it to the extent of of feeling these things, just like if you're reading a novel or anything else, you can, you can feel these emotions of the character as well. That's really my focus. One last question. Okay. All right, let's give Leo another hand.